This week I'm flying to Los Angeles. Are you on the same flight? And I'm sitting down with the doctor who has scanned a quarter of a million brains. He's gonna scan my brain, we're gonna find out if I have it. Do you think I have ADHD? So... <laughs> Fine. Come on. That's it, right. You've got your own phone. Okay. What's that? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, welcome. How are you doing? either, so no, I have to ride over. Hello, you right? Hello, how are you? Oh my gosh, I need a stylist. Pleasure to meet you. So nice to meet Thank you Thank you so much well. for being here. Oh. I've read every word in your book and it's just so... So inspiring for so many reasons, but uh, I'm sure we'll talk about it. You're, you're incredible, incredible. Do you need anything, my team? I think I, I'm not someone that's really into showbiz. Right. I don't really watch TV, don't watch a lot of movies, I'm just not that guy. So I tend to know people from a very narrow perspective of like, they, they are an actor in Hollywood. And getting to know all that stuff about your earliest years completely changed my perspective on like who Jada Pinkett is. Right. Completely changed my perspective. Like the girl from Baltimore, I just, I didn't know any of that stuff. Oh, yeah. So I thought Hollywood actress, that's what I thought. <laughs> you know? <Right. laughs> You're like, oh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Another thing I learned from reading the book, which is going to shock you that I didn't know, but this shows how little I am tuned into media and Good Hollywood and all you. that, is your relationship with Tupac. Oh, yeah. Yeah, first day of school, Baltimore School for the Arts. And he had this big smile. And from the from right from there, inseparable. We became the best of friends from that moment on. We just connected. It was as if we already knew each other. It's crazy. Almost a year later, he gets shot in Las Vegas. You get a phone call while you're filming on set that he's from, I believe, from his mother, mm -hmm. um, Afini Shakura, and saying that he's in hospital in a coma. I've got this other picture that I found that I thought was um, relevant. Oh, now you, do you know why this is relevant? I do. Maxine and, and Tupac are both in, in that same picture. same picture. Yeah. Ah. I lost Maxine and Park back to back. So I like to, you know, this picture to be flanked by them. <laughs> Maxine was a good friend of yours. Um, Pac was your brother. Yeah, and she was like my sister, you know. Hey, thank you. Thank you. you. Wishing you all of the all of the love and everything in the world as you go forward and thank spread you. this story and do this tour. Because yeah, it's exactly what you deserve. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. 
that photo, when she posted it, I think it was a picture of a photo, which means she doesn't have the photo. Uh, so that when she says, I want to keep it, yeah, because yeah. yeah. she doesn't have the photo, I don't think she has the photo. See ya, bro. So how it works. We want to see the blood flow in your brain because it goes to different areas depending on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So today we want to see focus. I have a little concentration game on the computer. Mm -hmm. All it does is serve as the task to get mm -hmm. your brain really concentrated. It just mm -hmm. tries to keep your attention. So as long as you finish through the full 14 minutes, that's good enough. To actually see the imaging, we use an injection through the arm stream and it just locks into the areas of activity. It's radioactive, so the camera picks it up. So you're gonna inject me? Yes. With some radioactive stuff? Yes, while you're playing. That way, as the, the blood is going to the areas that normally do when you focus, it just travels along with it, just so we can see it. This is wild. I'm scared of needles, mate. We're about to find out. <laughs> you ever given blood? Hmm? You ever given blood? That's weird. Yes. All the time. <laughs> Giving so much more than blood. Money, organs, <laughs> ideas. <laughs> I've given so much. I'm so charitable. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to give something back, hit the subscribe button. <laughs> And remember, it's just a game. Have fun. We just ask that you try. Okay, okay. and so my this is determining my self-worth. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it feels. No, no, no. Sorry. A letter's gonna flash in the middle, just one at a time. I want you to hit the space bar for every single letter except X. Okay, try to just skip and avoid the letter X. Okay. Here we go. I got electrocuted. The uh, isotope that I gave to him, it has gone into the blood flow and just kind of resonates. So it's just acquiring at like a certain amount of time at each like angle of the brain. And it just kind of forms a full like 3D. It kind of gives us an idea of where the blood flows and maybe those certain parts of the brain aren't getting enough blood flow and that's why you can't remember or can't focus or etc. Still. So you can see a picture of it, my brain. I can see just the raw data for now. Okay. It goes through the like processing software to actually orient it to be those pretty pictures that you right. see. Right. How big was that? <laughs> Full of information. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> 160 IQ. She said, "I've never seen that much wisdom in one head." Shit. 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 <laughs> So you've had that the whole time. On inside out. Mm. Are you trying to discredit the size of my brain while I'm having it scanned? Yeah, maybe. The thing that makes the Dive Series successful isn't like me being a good host or any of those things. It's this platform we've built that is focused on optimization, technology, artificial intelligence, experimentation. The Dara CO team is about 25 people at the moment. And within that you have data scientists, head of experimentation, you have the team that um, manage AI distribution partnerships. So the show is on nine major airlines. This morning we announced that we're the first and only podcast streaming on um, Emirates, for example. We're the first and only to stream on British Airways. Um, um, streams in prisons in the UK. And we're about to announce 60 other distribution partnerships to stream all around the world in different places. Every episode before it goes out is, is A, B, and split tested 90 times. So like the Jada Pinker episode is already in, was already in testing during the conversation. 
because the magic trackpad under the table is recording everything she says, highlighting the best parts and sending it off to testing in real time. So then we understand the titles, the thumbnails, the descriptions before it goes live. Then if you look at a podcast episode when it's live, you'll see it change every single hour while it's live because it's testing in real time once it's live as well. This is what I'm speaking about when I say like a system. It's the system, the process and the technology that have made the podcast successful. I knew I was gonna get blamed, but like, it was insane. You say protection is your love language. Did you see that as a act of love? I've got this wonderful picture that I found. Oh, I know that picture. Do you know why this is relevant? I place, kids, yeah, I lost them back to back. That's the way it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And that's the way it is. Oh my God. Jesus Christ. I came across you, my brother's been a, he was actuarial scientist. He now works in one of my companies and he said to me, he said, Steve, he's like a mighty Jew, he's obsessed. When we were six, he was like, had an Excel document for his pocket money. He said to me, when I came into money, he went, there's only one thing I'm gonna ask you to do, Steve. And he said, you have to read this book. <laughs> That's what That's he awesome. said to me. And I read this book and it's completely changed my life. Oh, it's in terms so much of to money, me. it's completely changed my thinking. I'm, I've been an evangelist about this book for years now. And well, thank you. So it's so, so wonderful to me. Is buying a house a good or bad financial decision? I'll tell you my own experience, which was in my 20s and early 30s, my wife and I lived in like seven different cities and there was nothing better for us. Some of those were just like, let's try this new city for fun. Some of it was moving for work. We moved for her school and our ability to just get up and go, hand the keys back to the landlord. Nothing was more valuable than that. Once we had our son, our first kid, then very quickly, nothing became more valuable to me than having an established, secure home base that nobody could take away from me. If I didn't have kids, I think I would be like rent, rent forever. Really? And try, and try different cities, move all, move all around. What can be better than that? But when you have kids, what's more important to me is stability. I want my kids to go to a stable school, know their neighbors, have friends that they can be friends with for years. That's if, important. If we just think about investing, then in terms of, is buying a house a good financial investment? If you're buying a house because you think it's gonna be a good financial investment, stop. Like, even if it turns out in hindsight that it was, it doesn't matter. I think these are just purely lifestyle decisions. And I think so many people get screwed up when they're in a spot in their life where they should be renting because they need to be mobile. They need to move around to a new job, new career, new school, whatever it is, but they end up buying because they think they're gonna make money doing it. And that's, that's, like, that, that's the problem. So I own a house. And if I ended up losing money on it, I, I, I don't think I'd care. That that's not why I'm owning it. I'm owning it just because I want the stability for my family. Appreciate you so much. So much Thank yeah. you so much. so much. What a wonderful conversation. <laughs> oh, it gets, it gets interesting again. <laughs> you should mix this, dude. I will. Definitely. Cut to me mixing it. Hello, Skrillex, I need a favour. <laughs> 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 if her is coming in to mixing something on mine. <laughs> okay, Daniel Eamon will be here soon, um, and he's going to give me my results from my brain scans to find out if I have ADHD or not. Um, multiple tests, multiple phone calls. He's spoken to my family, spoken to my colleagues. They've done questionnaires, I've done questionnaires and we're about to find out if I have ADHD. Obviously there's been a huge rise in ADHD um, around the world, especially in the Western world. I have always known who I am. I've always known my strengths and my weaknesses and my strengths define me as much as my weaknesses do as well. And whether I have ADHD or not, 
The label itself, to me, doesn't tell me anything that I don't already fundamentally know about myself. And I think I've tried to design my life in certain ways to ensure that the things I struggle with don't stand in the way of my most important goals. I realize this isn't the case for everybody. You know, the diagnosis of ADHD in many cases has changed people's lives because it helps them to understand themselves, it helps them get the medication and treatment they deserve, helps them to understand the factors in the environment that will get the best out of them. But for me, I just, I'm Stephen, you know? The good, the bad, and the ugly. Whether you apply labels to that or not, the, the label that I apply is just Stephen. Let's go find out. I made a little slide presentation for him. So I think what we'll do is we'll have your laptop down here, and then when we're ready to pull it out, we'll pull it out. How are you? Hey, good to see you again. So great to see <laughs> you. Thanks okay. for having me on again. Oh, I'm excited to see you. Thank you for having me. Look at your brain. So I never will make a diagnosis from a scan. Okay. I make a diagnosis from all the information. First thing to do is look at a healthy scan. And all we should see is full, even, symmetrical activity. Color doesn't matter, it's the shape. It should be. The images on the right, the color matters. So it's what we call our active images. So the white is where things are really happening. It's really hot. Okay. And that's healthy. That's normal. And that's going to become very important for you. So if we look at your brain, it's a little bumpy. And so I'll ask you about toxins. Mm -hmm. Is there anything toxic? Have you ever lived in a mold-filled environment? Maybe yes. we should test you for that. But if we go back to what's healthy, lots of activity in the cerebellum, your cerebellum is sleepy where you can be obsessive when you're really interested in something, but if it doesn't interest you, it's hard for you to focus. Do you think I have ADHD? I do. The other thing I would ask is, what did teachers say about you? I went back to speak at my school and I remember one of the teachers came up to me, bear in mind at this age, I'm 24, 25 years old. And she said, you were a useless student, but you were nice. You were a nice person. I was never swearing or throwing chairs. I just couldn't sit in classrooms. I couldn't sit in classrooms and stay focused on what they were telling me, especially when I wasn't interested. I wanted to just take a second and, and give my perspective on ADHD in particular. And when I think about some of the most incredible role models that I have, whether it's your Elon Musks in the world or your Steve Jobs or your Emma Watsons or your Einsteins or your Richard Bransons, these people are often dyslexic, autistic, or have ADHD. So I don't see any of these things as a disadvantage. I see divergence as an opportunity to deliver to the world divergent results in your work, in your creativity, in your businesses, whatever it might be. You know, when you find these things out like later in life, when you find out you're dyslexic or you're autistic or you're, you have ADHD or whatever your neurodivergence is, it's, it is useful on one hand because it helps you to understand yourself a little bit. It gives you words and an explanation for divergent behavior that you've seen in your life and divergent results for better and for worse that you've achieved in your life. But there's always a risk with labels, you know? This is the science of labeling theory where we can start to see our labels as a prison sentence or as a inseparable part of our identity and we can start to become those labels. There's this test done to test what we call stereotype threats. They would ask black people to say their race before they did a test and then their test results would drop and that's a stereotype threat and it comes from the labels we give ourselves and how loaded some of those labels are. So, And that's why I'm always scared of labels because with labels come an implicit set of instructions about who you are and how you should behave and what you're capable of and sometimes those can hold us back so you know i'm just steve that is the label and it's good it's bad and it's ugly you know but that's the that's the only label that i think i care about and there's no one on earth there's no adhd 
brain on earth like mine. There's no ADHD brain that is the same. Um, there is no autistic brain that is the same. There is no dyslexic brain that is the same. There is no brain that is the same. And I think that is the best position for me to play from. Hi, I'm Logan with the Pushy Dog. <laughs> That is a wrap here in Los Angeles. Um, crazy, crazy week, crazy, crazy week. Flying back to London now, I'm not feeling so well. Busy week when we land back in London, lots of meetings, interviews, a lot of investment conversations. Some of my Dragon Den deals are coming into the office as well. So that's exciting. So back to London we go.